I request Dr. Mohammad Asaus to come online, start his screen sharing, and let us start with our first lecture on transforaminal endoscopic lumbar discectomy by Dr. Mohammad Asaus. Welcome, sir. Please start. Um, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Histonji. Um, Dr. Sami, thank you so much for the invitation. And I welcome you all, and I thank you so much um, for um, giving me the opportunity to share um, some knowledge in endoscopic surgery. I'm privileged to be part of this um, brilliant symposium, looking at the names who are taking part. Um, I'm definitely um, humbled and privileged. Thank you so much. Um, my passion for minimal invasive surgery started 11, 12 years ago, but I moved to full endoscopic surgery in the past four years. Um, I'm sure the audience is, is probably part juniors and part more senior, so hopefully I have something for, for everybody in the course of the coming 15 minutes. Um, this is my disclosure. Hopefully, we're going to talk about indications and limitations. Um, note that I didn't say contraindication because I think the transforaminal approach is extremely robust. Um, it certainly has limitations as, as um, any other approach. Um, we're going to talk about the procedural steps for um, transforaminal endoscopic lumbar discectomy, focusing on the craniocaudal approach, which I think is safe and versatile, and um, in the way, talk about some um, complications and how to manage them. Um, we know from um, previous um, couple of years, a three or four meta-analysis came out and all showed that actually endoscopic surgery, endoscopic discectomy does work. And when compared, like this paper from Albert Elf and group, when compared to tubular microdiscectomy and open microdiscectomy, the complication rates um, were actually less, in particular durotomy were less um, in um, endoscopic surgery. And never mind actually the length of stay and return to work because it doesn't matter if your patient goes home within six hours or 12 hours, but look at the VASA score in the leg and the back at two and three years follow up. And in particular, the ODI scores, and they were significantly better in the endoscopic group. Um, so the indications for the transforaminal approach, I think most, most discriminations can be taken out um, transforaminally. Um, the issue is always um, focusing on L5S1 in particular, if you have a cranially migrating disc at L5S1, you may struggle with that. But in experience hand, I think um, most, most of this condition can be taken out. Um, certainly, for lateral herniations are prime indication for um, the endoscopic transforaminal approach. Recurrent disc herniations after posterior interlaminar surgery, again, I think um, is an excellent indication. And then you, ex you extend your indication of the transformal approach from discectomy um, to the all too common foraminal stenosis and the lateral recess stenosis. Um, limitations, again, you know, high iliac crest. Um, most men, L5, S1, and high, high, the iliac crest might very well be in your way, especially if the fra fragment is cranially migrating. Um, very short for foramen, again, um, makes an issue with reaming and the introduction of the cannula. And if the foramen is collapsed because of, um, of severe degeneration, um, you have to do foraminotomy, uh, which again is very feasible um, with the endoscopic transforaminal approach. Low-lying exiting nerve root is, is an issue. And of course, if the fragment are docially embedded, um, you may have a problem getting those from the side. Uh, with the transforaminal approach, but these are limitations. But again, as I said, in experience, hands most of them can be done um, safely and effectively um, with the transforaminal approach. Um, the advantages of the transforaminal approach, apart from the first few points that I mentioned, that is actually quite possible um, to do it under sedation with the um, awake anesthesia. This will have um, an impact uh, in patients who suffer with significant comorbidities, elderly people, um, and, and morbidly obese patients. And again, it makes, um, all this makes um, the transformal approach um, very feasible for ambulatory service as a day case when your patient goes home within a few hours after the surgery. Um, so I'm moving to the craniocaudal approach. It's a safe approach, it's an all out technique. Um, the idea is simply to um, dock your working cannula in the lateral recess. You stay out of the foramen, sorry, out of the, of the disc all the time, and then you address the pathology where it is. So 
the concept is, is straightforward. You don't focus on the disc fragment, you rather focus on um, the compressed nerve root. So if this is a traversing nerve, <clears throat> Traversing the nerve root problem as indeed in this example, um, you just need to push your cannula immediately into the canal, um, but you are still all out um, in the canal to take the herniated fragment, which is pressing on that S1 traversing nerve root. Um, it gives you a safe um, bony landmark, which you can get very easily um, by going you know, at an oblique to the, to the disc space rather than a straight into the disc space. And the advantage with that is you are furthest away from the um, exiting nerve root, which is commonly um, comp compressed during the axis. So in the example before that, even L5S1, uh, you can see you know, how far you are when you come in obliquely at the distal space, how far you are from the exiting nerve root. Um, so the summary of the steps you know, are for the juniors in the audience it, are fairly straightforward. Decide your entry point of the needle, decide the landing point, and then you slightly ream the ventral part of the SAP to dock your cannula in the lateral recess. And I do that in every single case, regardless of the position and the location of the disc. So neither entry point, neither landing point, reaming of the SAP. And then you have to decide, is this a traversing nerve root problem? In which case, you just push in um, your cannula into the canal slightly, identify the traversing nerve root, and remove the sequestrum from the canal, whether it is at the disc level, central, cranial, or caudally migrating, or is this an exiting nerve, nerve root problem? Um, and then you just basically rotate your cannula 90 degrees up and take it, pull it out a little bit, and then you'll be looking at the exiting nerve root. So the first three steps are common for all this craniation, the same entry point, same landing point, same reaming process, and then you decide exiting root problem, is this a far lateral disc herniation or foraminal stenosis for that matter, or if this is an intracanal problem, and then you identify this reversing nerve root in the recess, and that's exactly where you landed anyway. Um, so this is, this is what you do, need to do first, decide the level, and if you're doing upper lumbar, usually seven, eight centimeters. L3, four, you are 10 centimeters from the midline. And um, L4, five, L5, this one, you're between 12 and 13 centimeters. If your patient is obese, you probably get another centimeter. If, if he or she are very thin, you are probably um, short one centimeter. But, you know, I put this in a question mark. It doesn't really matter the target dislocation because the approach to most discrimination is exactly the same. So if I'm doing L4, L5, I decide this is a 12 centimeter, so I mark the midline and I put a line 12 centimeters. This is the first thing you need to do in every single case. And then you need to do, draw two lines, and they're very simple to be honest. The first one is the AP line. This is just a 15, 20 degrees line, touching the tangentially the upper border of the ipsilateral pedicle and the inferior border of the contralateral pedicle here. So upper border to the inferior border, this is your AP line, which is here. Patient head is here, the feet are here, and then you need a lateral line, which is the more important of the two lines here, as you can see. And this is just a 45 degrees line. You just need to touch the back border, the back upper border of the caudal vertebra. So this is L4-5 disc herniation. So I'm transecting the upper border of the L5. So this is my lateral line. And the two lines will intersect somewhere around your 12 centimeter line for L4-L5. L4, L5. So AP line and the lateral line, and they will meet at L4-5 at 12 centimeters. If this was an L3-4, I promise you, they will meet around 10 centimeters. And if you are upper lumbar, the upper lumbar level, they will meet somewhere here. And I do the same for every single case. So this is what you need to see. This is the landing point. So if you are actually in that position, a little bit taken of the SAP on the lateral, which again is the more important of the two lines, you will be around the medial border of, of the pedicle um, on the AP. So this is an L3, L4. In that particular example, I took a 10 centimeter and both lines met at 10 centimeter and this is my landing point. So this is a step by step. I'll go very briefly through this video. So you put the needle and then you exchange the wire basically. Um, and then it's a matter of sequential dilators. and then you start reaming. And reaming with sharp end reamers, it's very straightforward and very, very safe. All what you need is to take a little bit of that ventral aspect of the SAP, 
And for L4, L5, I'm going to play the video for the reading here. So you ream until you reach or just past the medial pellicle wall for L4, L5. This is all what it is to reaming. The reaming is the idea of the reaming is to allow you to dock your cannula in the lateral recess to facilitate exposure of this traversing nerve root because the traversing nerve root is easily identified in the lateral recess. So the reaming, this is reaming and you stop there at the medial critical wall or just back. Just a millimeter or two past it, nothing more than that. And this is what you see. So you've decided your entry point, you've decided your landing point, you dock your cannula in the lateral recess, and this is what you see. Every single case is the same. And if you are systematic, you know for a fact that you will be successful in most cases. And this is what you see. You need to identify the SAP. So this is L4, this is L5. This is exactly the view on this video here. So this is cranial, this is caudal, patient in a prone position in this particular example. You need to identify the SAP and the pedicle, and very importantly, the posterior vertebral wall of the caudal vertebra, because that wall is really the, the difference or the mark between the canal, just dorsal to it, and the annulus and discus space ventral to it. So this is the video now, it's absolutely copy paste of what you see on the left. So this is the SAP, and you will see this is the pedicle, and you can see the pedural fat pulsating here. So I'm identifying the posterior vertebral wall having stained the disc with, with you know, um, contrast and methylene blue. So this is this disc space at six o'clock. And once you see the posterior vertebral wall, anything behind it is the disc herniation. There's no more to, to transform in a discectomy than these three points. So entry point, landing point, identify SAP, pedicle, posterior vertebral wall, and you are looking at the disc herniation here. And anything that you push into the canal parallel to the posterior vertebral wall is, is safe. The root is not actually lying on the posterior vertebral wall. You can see where the root is here. It's starting actually to peak on us. So this is the traversing L5 nerve root, and this is the disc herniation. And you take the disc, and this is the day case um, under sedation if I do it under lateral position. So this is the end of the surgery, free and mobilized traversing nerve root. So I'm going to finish with a couple of examples to see, to show you how robust the transforaminal approach. This is a high caudally migrating recurrent disc herniation in a young man um, who tried everything um, for the last four months uh, with pain in the leg, but nothing worked. And you can see this is reaching all the way um, down to the level of the pedicle. Um, on the right side. So L4, L5, caudally migrating, and this is the video. Nothing has changed, same approach, but you know for a fact you can either go through the pedicle, which I don't do, I just basically drill um, three, four millimeters of the caudal pedicle to give me more access to um, go caudally uh, with the flexible forceps. So drilling the pedicle, as you can see here, I'm going to speed this up. So, and once you do that, remember this is a revision case, so adhesions, and when I say revision after open surgery, I really mean open surgery. This guy had 10, 15 centimeters, um, you know, incision for his first surgery in another country. Um, and this obviously um, have a huge impact on the amount of adhesions that this pa patient will have in any further surgery. So again, that's the facet here. The pedicle is here. This is where the nerve root and, and the adhesions, and this is part of the disc herniation. And you work your arm, you drill down, and radio frequency again is your friend because it allows you to dissect, probe, feel, um, and again. And then once you've done the drilling, this is the fragment, obviously all stuck um, posteriorly. Um, but then eventually comes out. He used six or seven centimeter fragment. And that's a nerve root. Um, very small fragments attached to it. Doesn't really bother me because the root is free, pulsatile. Um, and that's what you want to see. So this is, this is what I meant by his previous sur surgery. This is the transforaminal approach. That's the total amount of the fragment. This is the huge five centimeter fragment that came out as you can see here. Um, and this is the pre-op pre -op MRI 
um, on the right, and this is what you have on the on the MRI first drop. The last case um, is a high compromise. Um, all common. If you if you've done enough um, um, fusions, um, you would see quite a few adjacent level disease. This is what's done somewhere else um, six or seven years ago. Lovely lady, 74, um, and she has fusion from L2 to S1. And um, surprise, surprise, you know, um, she had a T12, L1, L1, L2, um, disc um, herniation and severe disc degeneration, as you can see, and um, surgical imbalance as well. But um, she didn't want any major surgery. Um, so um, the main problem with lady was weakness in the right leg, and it was all lower motor neuro, low, all lower motor neuro, nothing actually um, upper motor neuro, which indicated to me that probably it's L1, L2, the problem, not T12, L1. Um, and indeed, looking at the MRI, this is L1, L2, high compromise of the canal, as you can see, with a huge central disc. Um, and looking at L, T12, L1, uh, the canal is not actually too bad. So, but given the fact that the symptoms uh, and the signs were all actually lower motor neuron, I still did um, T12, L1, but I didn't, I didn't think it was the problem. So, again, same approach. The only advice um, for um, the ladies and gentlemen started um, in the upper lumbar and the lower thoracic, do not pass, do not ring past the mid pedicle wall because the dura will be looking at you because the you know, thick, thick fatty dura there. So, I'm going to finish with this video. So, again, um, the foramen was absolutely um, um, occluded. So this is foraminal, um, um, foraminotomy, foraminotomy for the huge SAP. And then you start to make your way. So this is, this is, um, this is caudal, this is cranial. Um, identify the flavum and open the space. I'm gonna speed this up a little bit. So it is a matter of identifying the nerve root. If you find, if you take one thing from this presentation, uh, it is a discectomy surgery but it's a nerve compression surgery. If you want to find the disc and make sure that you take it completely out, find the most important structure, which is not the disc, it's actually the nerve root. So you can already see, so this is the dura, everything is stuck here. This is a big disc herniation looking at us here. So once, once I see the most important structure that I can hurt, I know it is safe because I can see it, I can dissect it, and then it's a matter of removing this herniation. And that's, and that's what, what was done in this case. So, and you can go all the way in. So you work laterally, but then you work ventrally, you know, all the way central and even to the contralateral side if you want. Thank you so much, Dr. Mamadasos. Wonderful presentation. So this is, so I'll just show you the report, the MRI. So this is a pre-op, this is post-op. Um, I did actually visit T12L1. Um, I took some part of the, of the, of the, of the um, herniation centrally. And, and this is the L1 and 2, the most important. And see, she has a canal and she improved postoperatively. Um, complications, um, I'm happy to take that in the discussion. But the most important thing in this approach is find the nerve root, as I said, to find the discrimination and effectively remove it. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you so much. Excellent presentation.